my least favorite time of church is not time change Sunday, summer, or even a holiday weekend. Up until the COVID-19 stay-at-home order season, my least favorite time of the year at church is the political season. And it started early this year. Then it took a pause for the coronavirus. But as you can see online, things are again shifting to politics. Every year, people get mad and threaten to leave the church unless I publicly promote their favorite candidate, endorse their political party, or speak to their pet issue. Often, in fact, most of the time, actually, I have angry people on both sides of an issue. I don't look at opinion polls to determine my messages. Instead, I spend time in prayer and in God's word to understand what he wants for us. I want to share what God has for our church and not be co-opted into any person's particular agenda. And so instead of being divided over politics, we should be united around Jesus. The reality is I'm not sure that America has ever been more divided politically. Talk radio, television commentators, and the immature, impulsive use of social media fictitious forwards, and fake news, they all fan the flames of anger. And much of the anger is based in fear and concern, worried about the direction and the state of our nation. And really, there's a lot, to re- a lot of reasons to be worried. Since abortion became legal in 1973, there have been more than 60 million abortions in our country. Over 60 million babies. Every 10 seconds, a child is abused or raped. More than four children die from child abuse and neglect on a daily basis. And over 70% of those children are below the age of three. 43% of U.S. children live without their father. There are nearly 750,000 teenage pregnancies a year. There were over 127,000 reported rapes in 2018. There were 16,214 murders and manslaughter cases. Church attendance and membership has declined by nearly 20%. The percentage of Americans who profess to be Christian is at an all-time low. We have plenty of reasons to be concerned. And I didn't even start reading the statistics about personal debt, national debt, the decline of academic standards, and the political corruption. Really, it's all just too very discouraging when we get into the very deep details. The fact is, America needs help. So what's the answer? What, what do we do? Does the church stand by and, and watch as America sides, uh, slides down the slippery slope to hell? Do we start a political party of our own? Do we picket and petition and protest all those things that we disagree with? Is the answer Christian television, talk radio? Do we solve it with Facebook? A good, quippy post goes a long way, right? What do we do when a nation has lost its spiritual foundation? What should be the response of the church? It's not the first time that this has happened. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was on a spiritual and political roller coaster. It seemed to be on an endless cycle. The nation would lose a war and be taken captive. And in response, people would cry out to God, burn the idols, destroy the pagan altars, and declare they would only serve the one true God. God heard their prayers in in a time of peace and prosperity followed. Then people would get comfortable and take their blessings for granted again. Morality would decay. Sexual sin inside and outside of the church would increase. Worship of the one true God would fade away. Idol worship would return. And every time when they turned away from God, Israel was defeated by their enemies and taken captive again. Persecuted and oppressed. Then they would return to God, pleading for his mercy and his presence and the glory to be restored. God responded to their prayers, and uh, he provided peace and prosperity when they turned to him. 
And then once again, they would take for granted the blessings and they would repeat the cycle. Sexual sin, moral decay, spiritual decline, political corruption, selfish, immoral leaders. Does any of this sound familiar? I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about back in King Solomon's time. People gave sacrificially and Solomon built an elaborate temple to honor the Lord. The dedication of the temple was an amazing, an amazing event, an outpouring of worship and celebration. Solomon prayed a prayer that officially dedicated the temple. And in the prayer, he prayed these words. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 24 to 31. It says, when your people, Israel, have been defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against you, and when they turn back and confess your name, praying and making application before you in the temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people, Israel, and bring them back to the land you gave them and their fathers. When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you, and when they pray towards this place, and confess your name, and turn from their sin because you have afflicted them. Then hear from heaven and forgive the sins of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them the right way to live and send rain on the land you gave your people for an inheritance. When famine or plague comes to the land, or blight or mildew, locusts, or grasshopper, or when enemies besiege them. Whatever disaster or disease may come, and when a prayer or plea is made by any of your people, Israel, each one, aware of this afflictions and pains, and speaking out his, and spreading out his hands towards the temple, then hear from heaven, your dwelling place. Forgive and, and deal with each one according to all he does, since you know his heart, for you alone know the heart of men, so that they will fear you and walk in your ways all the time they live in the land you gave our fathers. What a prayer. What a request. And it's interesting that Solomon attributed the challenges Israel continually faced, not to their enemies, but to God's disobedient people. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it says, When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because of the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt down on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and they gave thanks to the Lord saying, He is good. His love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep and goat. In today's money, that's about $55 million worth of cows and $24 million worth of sheep. And, and to accomplish that many sacrifices would require 20, it would require 20 sacrifices a minute for 10 hours a day, for 12 days. It was a massive and elaborate celebration of God's presence and power. And sometime later, God appeared to Solomon in response to his prayer. And here's what God told Solomon in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 12 to 13. God tells him, says, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land and send a plague among my people. Now, why would God do that? Remember Solomon's prayer. Those things occurred because God was judging his people for their sin. It's very important to note that God's people 
were being judged. The people who knew him and knew what it was to serve him. God says to Solomon, when my people have strayed from me, when the nation has turned to pagan altars and forgotten to put their trust in me, when my hand of blessing is removed, this is what I want you to know and do. God's instruction to a nation in crisis is the promise that we are learning today. Remember, we're talking about the promises of God. And this should be how we respond as the church of America to the crisis that we face. This is, this is it. This, this is how we see real lasting change in America. Do you want to see America healed? Then 2 Chronicles 7.14 is the answer. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. That was the answer for Israel. And I believe that it's God's answer for America today. Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear them from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now I want to slow down a little bit and and really look at that verse because some of you've heard it quoted hundreds of times and I, I want you to not only know it, but I want you to understand it and embrace God's instructions. Remember the goal of this verse is for our land to be healed. And God said, for that to happen, if my people who are called by my name, who, who are God's people, who, who's that? That's Christians. It's us. Followers of Jesus. God's people aren't a political party. They are the people who love God. And right off the bat, you may struggle with God's word going, us? The problem, is, the problem isn't us, it's them. We've really made the challenge in our country and us against them. But God is not speaking to the sinners when he's talking to Solomon. He's speaking to the church. Are you a follower of Jesus? If so, then God's plan for America starts with you. Next, God tells us what to do. If you want to see a turnaround in America, this is the formula. This is the answer. Now, I'm aware some of you aren't, aren't going to like God's answer. You, you have a different way that you want to accomplish this. God's answer may be controversial. This isn't, it isn't a popular answer necessarily, but it's the right answer. Because God's answer is always better than your answer. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves... The word used for for humble in this context, it means stop being arrogant, self-focused, sinful behavior and approach God in repentance with a humble attitude. It It leads to the question of how do you humble yourself? First, you have to acknowledge that you don't have all the answers and that's hard. But we, because we often act like we have all the answers, all the solutions figured out. Christians are often characterized as arrogant know-it-alls because that's how we've often acted, especially in online situations. We really should apply God's instruction to our lives before directing anger at others who aren't serving him. It's arrogant to think that you know how to fix all the problems. Only God has the answers. Only God has all the answers. Second, to humble yourself, you have to worship. Worship acknowledges the authority and power belongs to God. Worship acknowledges that our creator God has the answer, not his humble creation. When we lift our hands or bow our knees to God, we humble ourselves before him. There's been a resurgence of worship in American radio stations. Uh, They play worship songs. People attend worship concert, and, and and it's wonderful, but true Pure worship doesn't require a big-name artist or impressive musicians. Worship isn't just singing a song and calling it good. Worship is a lifestyle. 
Worship is how we respond to God with our lives, our actions, our words, our sacrifices, our choices. It's a direction that leads to humility. The word says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. God's formula for healing America, God's answer is for you and me to pray. That seems simple, doesn't it? It's the last thing that many of us want to do. We often seek answers through politics instead of prayer. If we can just elect the right person and enact the right laws, then America will be healed. But when you really think about it, that that doesn't make sense, does it? It's not a political problem. It's a spiritual problem. Why would you think a political answer could ever solve a spiritual problem? Let me ask you this. If we elect someone as president who believes exactly as we believe, and every official, federal, state, local, all believe like us, Would that solve the problems in America? Imagine that we got all the laws right, from zoning laws to tax code, to immigration policy to crime bills, exactly the way we think it should be. Would that usher in the kingdom of God? Would the hearts of the parents be turned back to their children? Would greed and pride be legislated out of existence? Would that solve the problems of sexual immorality, anger, violence, suicide, and addiction? Of course it wouldn't. Because no human system has the ability to change the heart. Now, before you send any angry emails or Facebook message to me, listen to me very closely. I am in favor of Christians in politics at every level. We should be involved. But never mistake involvement in politics for God's answer. I love America. I pray for our leaders. During this time, I pray more than any that I ever have. But my hope for the future and my hope for the world is not in them. I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. God may and I hope will use some of these men and women to bring healing to our land. God may and I hope will Use America to bring healing to the world. But understand this. Healing is found in Jesus Christ alone. He is the hope of the world. My citizenship is in heaven first and the world second. But we try a lot of answers. Angry emails, accusatory Facebook posts, political uh, politics, picketing, petitions, ranting and raving. Anger and intimidation. These are all things that we try oftentimes before we pray. When we do, we are fighting the battle according to the playbook of the enemy instead of following God's instructions. God's answer is clearly revealed in Scripture. But Christians in America aren't doing it. Why? Because prayer takes time and humility. People want instant answers, but God has called us to pray. We try to control things since God isn't doing it in our timetable. Even as God tells us to humble ourselves, we push our ideas and opinions forward. Prayer is much more difficult than forwarding an email or sharing another Facebook post. Prayer takes focus and effort. Prayer puts the emphasis on God and instead of us and our feelings. Prayer doesn't gain social media followers. There's no glory in prayer. Your ego isn't fed in prayer. Prayer doesn't make you look powerful or important. Prayer is a strength for the church. But all too often, we are tempted to turn to politics instead of prayer. So try this. Every time that you're tempted to post something political on Facebook post a prayer instead and not a like God get that liar prayer. Post a genuine prayer for unity and for God's purpose for our country. There's a reason God said to humble ourselves before we pray. Because if we don't get humble and acknowledge that we don't have the answers, we will never turn to him in prayer. If we want our land healed, it starts with humbling ourselves 
seeking his face in, in, in prayer. Prayer has to be a priority in your life, is it? Prayer is the key to the change you are trying to vote into existence. And that'll be a great conversation starter. I can't think of a better way to lead than to lead in prayer. But understand, it gets really tough. Because we're quick to point out the sins of society and slow to point out the sins within the church. There's something wrong with the church today. And I'm not just talking about Calvary. The divorce rate in the church is essentially the same as outside the church. Just as many people struggle with pornography and sexual addiction within the church as they do outside the church. We tolerate the, we tolerate the three G's, greed, gossip, and gluttony, and pretend they are not a sin because we enjoy them so much. <coughs> To avoid offending people, the church sacrifices its moral authority. Standards are lowered and holiness is diminished in an attempt to build and keep a crowd. To turn from our wicked ways means to change direction. It's a course correction, a new path, the opposite way of what we're going. If we're going to clean up America, let's start with the church. If we, if we really want God to heal our land, we must first get to the place where we acknowledge our own need for spiritual healing. If we're going to see revival in America, it must start in the church. And it's time for a turnaround. I long for the day where we will get as excited about worshiping God as we do at a concert or a football game. I long for the day when church attendance matters more than sleeping in, going to the lake, catching up on homework. I'm disturbed by the fact that, that two-thirds of our church miss more than half the time. I pray that church becomes a priority again. I long for the day when prayer is more important than the latest thing to stream on Netflix. I pray that there'll be a time when the church lives on a high standard or standard of sexual purity, different from the world that we claim we're trying to save. I long to see the day where we have holy and strong marriages. I long to see our habits different from the world. God, heal our land. And God, start right here. It's easy to get excited about the church needing to turn from its way, but when we get personal, it gets harder, but it starts with you and it starts with me. God says, if my people pray, understand that that's you. That's me. Consider it this way. If Spencer Click, who is called by my name, will humble himself and pray and seek my face and turn from his wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive his sin and will heal his land. That's a little more difficult, isn't it? I'm not, I'm not going to identify your wicked ways. You know. You know the areas of your life where you aren't following him and aren't fully pleasing him. Make that verse personal and ask yourself, what do I need to change? What areas of my life are not pleasing to God? It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and will turn from their wicked ways. If we do that, what will happen? God says, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and will heal their land. Isn't that interesting? Our worship, prayer, and repentance leads to God forgiving us. Then when we stand before him, humble and forgiven, acknowledging that, that all power, all authority, and all answers are in him. Look what happens. The goal, what we've hope, been hoping for, and what we've been trying to accomplish on our own, is what happens. God will heal our land. And that's what I want. I know that's what you want. Desire isn't the issue. The issue 
is, is, and the question is, are you willing to follow God's plan? Are you willing to follow God's plan? Do you see, do you want to see America healed so much that we are willing to humble ourselves, worship, repent, and pray? Are you willing? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. That promise was originally given to Israel, but I believe that promise is also true for us today. If God's people will do this and pray this way, our land will be healed. We can't vote revival into existence, but we can pray revival into existence. So let me finish with this story. The, the real sad thing is that Second Chronicles 7.14, it, it didn't happen. God gave his people a direct promise. Even with that promise, God's people continued in their wicked ways, and that result was God's judgment on the land and on the people. They were conquered by enemies. And the very temple that was once filled with the glory of God was destroyed. Am I, am I predicting that for America? Well, I'm certainly not God, and I can't tell you what's ahead for our country. I can tell you that it's time for God's people to follow God's instruction and see God's plan revealed. My heart is troubled because I fear what God had to do to get Israel to repent is what he will have to do to us to get us to repent. And that was his judgment. That that won't be judgment reserved for those people that don't know God. It's judgment against his people, us. And while I do not believe that the COVID-19 situation is God's judgment, you can now get a small taste of how uncomfortable a major disruption to our regular lives can be. Imagine how much worse it would be if it was God's judgment. And so I would suggest that we should arrange our lives presently and press into God and humble ourselves quickly because the ball is in our court. That's intimidating and exciting. We can turn our nation around. We can see all the changes that we are praying for. It starts with God's church. The challenge for each of us is, will you be and do what he has asked you to be and do? Will you humble yourself, pray, turn from your wicked ways, and seek God's face? If we do that, he will forgive our sins and heal our land. It's time for God's church to be united, not around a political candidate or party, but around the cross of Jesus. The hope for us and the hope for our world is Jesus. That's a promise that we can all hold on to. Second Chronicles 7.14 is the promise verse that we're holding on to this week. Humble yourself. Turn from your wicked ways and pray and allow God to shape your life and heal our land. Let me bless you today. Father, right now, I pray that you bless your people. Bless them in their homes. Bless them in their place of work. Bless them in their families. Bless them in their relationships. Bless them in their coming and their going. Bless them so that they may be a blessing to others. I pray today that you would make your spirit so clear and abundant to us and that we would be filled with your glory. Bless us today so that we can be a blessing to others. We thank you and we praise you. In your precious name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thanks so much for being here with us today. I'm I'm glad you're here. Let me encourage you. Would you share this message on Facebook or YouTube or social media so that we can continue to spread the gospel and share God's love with other people? We're looking for new ways and creative ways to be evangelistic and share the love of Jesus, and that's one of the great things that you can do. Just a reminder, you can join us each night 
uh, Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Uh, for a fun, not fun, but for a, for a devotion at the end of each uh, night where we'll talk about what God's doing and challenge you to grow each and every day in your relationship with Jesus. Thanks for being here with us today. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.